next slide, Trevor. We're going to go to um, tell you a little bit about how to learn about more webinars, podcasts and blogs, et cetera. You can follow us on social media at Voyager Sopras Learning or Voyager Sopras. You can see here at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. You'll find great information um, on all those platforms, um, Things, good things to read, blogs by experts, and more webinars like today's. So make sure you check that out and follow us on social. Uh, next slide. Now it is my honor to introduce today's presenter. Trevor Muir is Trevor of the Epic Classroom. Um, he's an educator, a speaker, and an author who believes in the transformative power of education. He's well known on social media and for his speaking around the globe. Um, he is the founder of the Epic Classroom. Um, at that uh, social media platform, he connects with so many educators around the world about teaching and learning. Um, he also teaches pre-service teachers at Grand Valley State University in Michigan. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Trevor. Uh, Trevor, it's all yours. All right. Thanks, Jean. And hi, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, our webinar today. I am so excited to spend the next little bit of time with you uh, just diving into this subject matter. Um, and, and it's just, you know, it's so funny because like when this, do you all remember the pandemic? Like when the, all that stuff, of no, do we remember the pandemic? You know, it, we're like at the three year mark of where all that began and yet it feels more like 21 years. Uh, I, I like to think of COVID years as like dog years. So it's been 21 years of, of this whole new learning experience. And I remember, and the reason I'm bringing this up to start is I remember starting to do virtual teaching with my own students, but then also with educators three years ago. And there was just this daunting aspect of logging on and, and trying to connect with people from a distance and not having the ability to like connect on the level of what happens when we're in person. And yet I feel like in the last few years, we've kind of figured some things out. And that's why I'm so excited to see people are still showing up to this type of learning experience because I can be here at my home in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, you could be anywhere else in the world, and yet we get to come together and uh, talk about literacy, talk about ways to engage students uh, and get them excited and engage in what is happening in our classroom. So as Jean said, uh, I've been a teacher here in Michigan for quite a while, uh, primarily teaching middle and high school, um, and I've been an English teacher. That's been my primary role. Um, and so my whole teaching career has been this ongoing journey uh, of discovering different ways, new ways, fresh ways, effective ways of engaging students, especially in literacy and, and their ability and love and passion for reading and writing. And uh, I, I've learned a tr few tricks along the way, mostly from other educators. And so I thought maybe uh, we could spend some time and share some of those tips with you. Uh, so let's do that. But first, I just want to get the cat out of the bag. Uh, we are meeting virtually here. And as I said, can be a little hard to connect sometimes, uh, especially when you get when I don't get the feedback of seeing your faces and and see and try to gain comprehension. It's the stuff that we've all been going through as we've had to lead at different times in these virtual spaces. So with that being said, please feel free to use the questions panel. Gene is going to be monitoring that, and then we're going to make sure we cut out a good at least 10 minutes uh, to just kind of dive into any of those questions or engage in some dialogue there. So feel free to interact in that way. Um, and then, yeah, just uh, engage and hopefully some of what we talk about is helpful on here. But I gotta say before we do that, I just wanna point out right now that you know, this whole pandemic, even though we're on the tail end of it now, uh, it's taken its toll on all of us, right? Like, you know, as an educator, I was teaching my, my students at the beginning of 2020 and thinking this is gonna be the best year yet. And then all of the pandemic happened and I was not versed in teaching in these virtual spaces. And I got to tell you, it took its toll on me at first. I want to show you a picture, an image of what I looked like before the pandemic started, just to give you a little bit of a reference point uh, to how much it's aged me. This is me before the pandemic, younger, brighter, more youthful. Okay, that's not actually me. That's actually Ralph Macchio, the karate kid. I just want to know if you're paying attention. I can't see you right now. No, this is me before the pandemic definitely a little bit more youthful looking. This is me one month into virtual teaching, right? 
Okay, that's not actually me either. That is, uh, uh, that, that's where I put my picture into that app that was floating around in the beginning of the pandemic where you could make yourself look a little bit older. Are you familiar with that? That Yeah, I mean, it was a long time ago now. As I said, 21 years. That was back in the early stages of the lockdown portion of the pandemic, or as I like to call the Tiger King portion of the pandemic. But I mean, like just even bringing up these lame dad jokes about the pandemic has got me thinking about the struggles we have and engaging students back when the pandemic was at its full force and when we had to use every bit of technology and way of connecting with them to do the very difficult, sometimes very challenging task of engaging them in what we're trying to engage them in. And literacy can be a challenge with that, right? Getting students who don't know the joys of literacy, don't necessarily know the joys of reading and writing, but then getting them to do that in a virtual space or a space where they're wearing masks and it's difficult to connect or they can't sit together. Or maybe you're like uh, a teacher of, of kids my daughter's age who's in first grade right now, but started out her educational journey in preschool at the very beginning of COVID. Or my son who's in third grade was just beginning to read. And this was their very first exposure to literacy outside of the home environment. And now I'm having to teach this to you with all of these other obstacles in our way. And I wanna give space to that, man, it's been hard, right? Like this has been a real challenge engaging kids, engaging students with all of these obstacles. But now some of those obstacles are starting to go away, knock on wood. We, have, we got plenty of wood around, knock on wood wherever you are at right now. But like some of those obstacles are going away. And now it's like, all right, how do we take some of the best practices, the best ways that we learned to engage students when it was really, really difficult? How can we apply those to the space we're in now? How can we engage students? And one of the things that I went back to over and over during COVID in, in the virtual space and then in the distance learning spaces, the thing I've been going back to is the power of authenticity and purpose. And I wanna explain what that means and how we can view using the power of authenticity and purpose to engage students. And this is something that I did a lot before the pandemic, but really leaned into the last three years. And I feel like it taught me, it made me a better educator. I wouldn't wish it on anybody having to teach during a pandemic, but because we did, we are now better practitioners at our work. And so let's take some of those practices and figure out how can we engage students more. And so I wanna talk about the power of authenticity and purpose as it applies to engaging students in literacy tasks. But before we do that, I kinda of wanna pitch a little framework to you or pitch a big idea. And then as once we kind of establish that, we're gonna start zooming in and uh, really focusing it on how do we specifically do this in terms of literacy. So let's do it. And I wanna start by that start that conversation, the zoom out, with talking about the power of story. Stories are really, really powerful for us human beings, right? Stories are how we pass down knowledge and technology and ideas and faith traditions for millennia is through this power of story. There's something about our brains that connect with a well-told story, whether it's being told to you or you are reading it or you are experiencing it. And, and I wanna kind of go into why stories are so powerful first, and then we'll talk about how do we use that to engage students in literacy and get some of those struggling, disengaged students on board with what we're doing. So first, I wanna define a story. There was a mythologist named Joseph Campbell who studied thousands and thousands of myths throughout human history, and he discovered that there's a pattern to be found in every good story. And he calls this pattern the hero's journey. And because it's in thousands of stories throughout human history and spanning across cultures, kind of means that there's something universal about story, something that all humans connect with it. And so he calls it the hero's journey. And he says, in every good story, there is a hero, the protagonist that lives in what is called the known world. And the known world is what they're used to. But he says, in every good story, there's a call to adventure, an introduction of conflict, a problem. And it draws the hero out of the known world into the unknown. And once the hero is in the unknown, it's difficult because it's unknown. And so in the unknown, this problem that drew them out of it is, is forcing the hero to experience challenges and obstacles. It's hard, they don't know their way around. That's why they call it the unknown. But they also experience mentors and guides to help them overcome those challenges and obstacles so that they can transform in some way and then eventually return back to the known world to solve whatever that problem was. And the reason they can now solve it is because they have what Joseph Campbell calls the elixir. The elixir is what they gained from undergoing the unknown world. 
right? This is the shape of any good story you've ever heard. It's the Lion King and Simba having to go through this whole journey to find out who he really is in the circle of life. It's the story of any Steinbeck novel or Romeo and Juliet or, or, or Odysseus. It, it's the same shape of a story. This is what connects with us. And this is what's universal. This engages human minds. In fact, there, there was a, a cave painting or a series of cave paintings that were discovered in uh, on this island of Sulawesi in Indonesia in 2020. Great year, by the way. So in 2020, they found this cave painting of a pig on the walls of this cave and they discovered, the archeologists have discovered that these early humans 44,000 years ago were actually telling stories to each other on the walls of this cave. Meaning humans have been telling stories using this pattern of the hero's journey at least 40,000 years before we even had the ability to write them down. Stories are a part of what make us human. This is why, oh, and by the way, we've been telling stories about pigs ever since. Are you with me, right? Like this is the reason that we still teach the story of the Odyssey to high school freshmen all across America because there's something about a hero who will do anything to get home to the one that they love that still resonates with us. Are you with me now, right? Like that story still works 3000 years later. There's a reason anytime I've ever taught Romeo and Juliet to high school freshmen, when it gets to that pivotal moment where the two star-crossed lovers don't act like that was a spoiler. You had 500 years to read that one. But whenever it gets to that big moment, I can always turn to the students and be like, guys, can you imagine being a teenager, which Romeo and Juliet were? Can you imagine being a teenager be and being that hopelessly in love? And it's like in unison, they all go, aha, because there's something about a story that's even 500 years old that still resonates with us. There's a reason Probably, I'm guessing, every one of you cried your eyes out in 1997 when you saw this. Yeah, you know you did if you were old enough. And you know what? You probably and you probably knew exactly what that, that, that video was or what movie that came from the second I hit go on that slide, right? Because you're probably still a little mad at Rose. Because you know he didn't have to die. There was more than enough room on that door for both of them. It's like, Rose, scoot over a little bit and we can both live. And she's like, no, I need to have both my arms on the door so I can blow my whistle. It's like, yeah, it's like, scoot over, Rose. There's more than enough room. And I don't, I can't see you right now. You're spread out all over the country. But I'm guessing, I'm just guessing that maybe I got a little bit of a grin out of you when I said there was more than enough room on that door. Yeah, because you remember that. Even though that movie came out 20, how old are we? 27 years ago, you still are a little pissed off at Rose, right? Like you still got a little space in your brain reserved for being angry at that fictional character, knowing that there was an injustice caused out on the Atlantic that night, right? Like you remember that. Why do we remember that? Do you ever wish you could just clear out the information in your brain and you could like memorize Shakespeare or, or learn quantum physics, but you're like, nope, I'm gonna stay mad at Rose. Why? Why do you do that? And I have to guess. I, my, my, my best guess is because it was presented to you in the shape of a story. And there is something human about stories. We don't forget them. There's something about characters having to solve a problem that engages us at a very deep level. And in fact, there's actually neuroscience. There's research that shows why this happens. A group of researchers at Princeton discovered this phenomenon called neural coupling, where they discovered that when you hear a well-told story at a subconscious level, your brain doesn't know that you weren't actually in the story. In fact, it even mirrors the brains of the storyteller from when the event actually occurred. So on, for all intents of purposes, intents and purposes, oh boy, I got a lot of English teachers on here right now, so I better be careful on how I use idioms like that. Was that even an idiom? You got me nervous, folks, and I can't even see or hear you. For all intents and purposes, we're gonna go with it. At a subconscious level, your brain doesn't know you weren't on the Titanic with Jack and Rose on that door that was had ample space for both of them, right? You know you weren't there, but your brain doesn't. It was even releasing the same hormones that would be released if you were actually there, right? When you saw that movie and there was the suspenseful parts it was building up, your brain releases cortisol. This is the stress hormone. When your brain releases dopamine, this is euphoria and joy. It's what happens at the climax of a story, what everything is building to. It happened when you saw that movie 
It happens when you actually find out you're going to be okay, right? And it happens when you hear a story about it, your brain doesn't know the difference. When you build a connection with a character, when you care about their outcome more than just yourself, your brain releases oxytocin. This is the love hormone. This is what happens when mothers give birth. Wild amounts of oxytocin is released in their bloodstreams to form that initial connection with their babies. And wild amounts of oxytocin, probably a little less, are released in your brain when you form a connection with a character in a story. Stories are powerful. In fact, another group of researchers discovered that when these three hormones mixed, when, when cortisol, dopamine, and oxytocin are mixed in our bloodstream, are released by our brains, this is the chemical makeup of what we know as empathy. When you care about something more than just yourself, beyond just your own outcome, when you can place yourself in the shoes of another and you care about it, when you engage with something bigger than yourself, you can see I'm starting to narrow down to our topic here. When you do that, this is actually what's happening at the deep neurological level. This is what happens to us through the power of story. And so, Knowing this, knowing that stories equal engagement for the human mind, knowing that stories make us want to learn more, make us want to engage more at a deeper, le deeper level, how do we take advantage of that? I mean, how can we how can we harness this power of story that we if I had more time, I could keep geeking out with you about why stories are so powerful. But just trust me on this. Stories are part of what it means to be human. So how do we take advantage of that to promote deep engagement with literacy with students so that they want to learn? So they remember what they learn so that they can grow so we can take those students who struggle with reading. Who, who sometimes it feels like, gosh, I feel like I'm pulling teeth to get you to read your book. Or man, it just feels like an ongoing challenge to get you to even write a few words in the notebook when we do some write and journaling or writing or reflecting. What if stories are part of what can help unlock some of that deeper engagement? And, and really, if we can go zoom back again, beyond just literacy, how do we just deeper engagement with students in general? because I think we've seen a lot of that. I took a, a survey on my, my uh, teacher Facebook page recently, the Epic Classroom asking, um, what are the biggest struggles you are facing in this post COVID environment? And the number one thing that I saw is student apathy. Students who are apathetic about learning and so therefore are really difficult to engage. So I guess you're guessing you're like, yep, that's what that's what I'm facing. So what if stories are part of what helps us unlock that? So let's look at it through the lens of literacy. And now that we've laid out what a story is and why it's so powerful, what if, hear me out here, what if we treated our students' time with us in the classroom or whatever medium you are teaching through as an unfolding story? What if we can actually plan learning experiences, units, to take the shape of a story and give students authentic, purposeful problems that actually matter to them that maybe they weren't exposed to at first? Maybe what if we viewed students as those characters, those heroes within the known world? This is what they know about the world, and we introduce real problems to them to solve because we know they're going to want to solve problems that actually matter. That's part of what it means to be human. What if we give them problems to solve and we find ways to tie literacy experiences in there to help assist in solving some of those problems? Now, what I just described here might sound familiar to you. It might sound like group projects or maybe not even group projects, class projects. When we give students problems to solve and say, all right, we're gonna use class time to solve this problem. Yeah, typically in school, we know that as a project. But often when we say project, it puts in shivers up your spine a little bit because we know what happens when we do projects in school, right? We know that projects are often very time consuming. They require resources. And we know that usually one student does all the work while everybody else just rides on their coattail. We know often that projects are more like the dessert of meals and not the main course. Let me explain. The main course meal is the meal you need, right? Like that's where you get your vitamins and sustenance. That's the meal you need. And the dessert is something that comes afterwards. You don't need a dessert to survive. Sometimes it's like, speak for yourself. It's like, no, yeah, desserts are great. But very often what we do with projects is it, it feels like something that comes after the main course. We're going to do all of this learning. We're going to read this book. So I'm going to say to you, all right, guys, we are going to read the book. Um, 
uh, of mice of men. So we're going to read of mice of men, and we're going to do some reading conferences. Maybe you'll write a book report on it, and you'll do some book dis book talks and discussion. We're going to read this book of mice of men, and then afterwards, you're going to get into groups and you're going to create uh, a game board for it. I forgot I had this slide in here. That is divine intervention there. So perfect. Just I forgot now. All right. So anyway. Uh, perfect. See, sometimes you just got to roll with it and not call out when it feels perfect, but I just feel like calling it out to you right now. Um, so you read the book and then you're going to create a game board for it. Fun, you know, and sometimes you get engagement on this, but the truth is if you ne if the groups, if kids never made their game board, they would have still learned the same amount of, from that unit, right? Like the game board is more of an assessment than really a project to enhance the learning, right? It came after the main course, it's a dessert. It's the same with like book dioramas. We're gonna read the book and then we're gonna create a diorama. Guess what, if we never made the diorama, we would have learned the same amount about the book, except now we don't have anything, we don't have an authentic problem. There's not purpose that's driving and pushing this learning around. Instead, it's like, hey, we're gonna learn this cause all the different motivators we have. We're gonna read the book because there's a grade, because there's a quiz. To, pressure from parents, pressure from teachers, maybe some students have a love of reading, but then a lot of students are like, well, I don't care about my grade, don't care about my parental pressure, I don't care about teacher pressure, and I don't have a love of reading, what's gonna make me want to actually read this book? And, and having this dessert at the end is probably not motivating it. And so this is a dessert, not a main course. What we want is main course. We wanna create main course learning experiences where a problem is introduced at the beginning of a unit and all the learning that takes place is somehow connected to solving that problem. And then what happens is, is when students are doing this type of learning, when they're done, they can look back at it and it's a story that they were a part of. They didn't know this problem, and I'm gonna illustrate this in a moment with literacy examples. I didn't know this problem existed, then it was in, introduced to me. This is the call to adventure. And then I had to solve this problem. I, I had to do something about it. And I had to learn these different things along the way. Now, and then we, we gain what's called the elixir. This is what you gain from the, the story, the, the unknown space. This is what we can actually do as students and it enhances the learning all the way around. In fact, there's research that shows that when students are engaged in purposeful work or service learning, we're, we're learning something while we're serving something bigger than ourselves. We're solving a problem while we learn specific content. Research shows that when students are engaged in service learning, there is a measurable uptick in their social development, meaning students collaborate and work better together when they're doing meaningful work. There's behavioral development, meaning kids are easier to manage, better behave, more mature when they're engaged in purposeful work. There's emotional development, meaning kids are more emotionally secure, less depression, less anxiety, more confidence when they're doing work that matters which by the way, makes sense. It feels good to serve something. We all wanna do this in our own work. We wanna believe that the work we're doing matters, right? Does that apply to you as an educator? That you maybe work a little bit harder when you're doing work that matters, that maybe you, you bring a little bit more passion and joy with you when you're doing work that matters. I can't see you right now, but I'd love it if just wherever you're at right now, raise your hand if you've ever been in a staff meeting that could have been an email. Yeah, I'm guessing people all over the country right now have their hands up because we all know what those staff meetings that were like. It's like, just send me the email. I don't need to be here at 7 a.m. to have you read a bullet point. So let me ask you, during those meetings, were you perfectly engaged? I don't know. I can't speak for you, but not me. I, th during the meetings that could have been an email, those are the ones where I'm talking to my neighbor or maybe I'm on my phone underneath my desk or whatever it is. I, my, my, I am not nearly as socially engaged, behaviorally engaged or emotionally engaged when I'm doing work that doesn't matter. But I'm guessing you've also been to staff meetings that were really valuable and useful for you. That where you were like, okay, this is something, we're solving a problem at school today. We're tackling a problem. We're, we're starting a new initiative, whatever it is. I bet you've been to good meetings too. And I bet during those meetings, maybe you're less inclined to be on your phone. Maybe you're more engaged with what's going on. Maybe you're growing better at collaborating and being more social and, and maybe you're a little bit more behaved, right? All of this applies for us and it applies to students. And what's interesting is this research also shows that when students are doing purposeful work, there's an uptick, oh, I don't have a slide for it, in their cognitive development. Meaning students learn at a deeper level academically and their literacy skills improve when they're doing work that actually matters to them. 
And so a lot of, and that's what the power of story does. Human beings are problem solvers. So what if we gave students authentic problems to solve and we found ways to utilize and tie in literacy along the way because we, they're not going to forget it nearly as easily because we don't forget good stories. We're still mad at Rose, remember? <laughs> so let's dive into specifics on literacy and how this applies to what I'm talking about here. So literacy, definition, you don't need this, but I'm gonna read it for my own sake as we kind of unpack it a little bit. Literacy, making sense of and engaging in advanced reading, writing, researching, listening, and speaking. These are the skills that encompass literacy. That's why literacy is so important in ELA classrooms and ESL classrooms. That's why literacy is important in math classrooms and science classrooms and history classrooms, because it's really about teaching students to engage and make sense of what they read, which happens in all subject areas, what they write, which happens in all subject areas, what they research, which needs to be something everybody knows how to do in the world. When they listen, which is something everybody needs to learn how to do in the world and when they speak, which is a skill that is going to be used over and over throughout their lives in many different settings. And so that is literacy. How do we promote it through this authentic story-based lens? All right. So. First off, let's talk about discovering literacy opportunities within authentic projects. How do we figure out how, where are the opportunities to tie it in wherever possible? Let's talk about supportive text for a moment. Finding, how do I find the right book, the right text, the right article, the right uh, thing, uh, the, the right, uh, any type of text that's going to support this authentic work that we're engaging students in. And I find it helpful to identify the text by first figuring out, all right, what's the theme of this big story that I wanna put my students through? So I'm trying to figure out what's the problem they're gonna solve. And, and we'll talk about what some of those problems can look like in a moment. All right, so what's the big idea here? As you know, if you teach ELA at least, a theme of a story, or if you were paying attention in English class at whatever point in your life, the theme of a story is the overarching lesson from a story that applies beyond the actual story in front of you. It's the big idea. Um, you know, so there's the subject of the story. That's the specific nitty gritty details of it. And the theme is the big takeaway. So for instance, my kids love the movie Finding Nemo. We've watched it a billion times. The subject of this story is, you know, you've got a bunch of little fish and it's really important that they don't swim too far away from the, the shelf or they're going to get scooped up by a scuba diver. That's the subject. My kids who live in Grand Rapids, Michigan, that's not really applicable to their everyday life. They can't take that lesson and apply it to their, their, their day at school. That's not really applicable. It's the theme that matters for them. That's the big idea, the big takeaway from the story, which might be something like, Sometimes you have to let go in, other for, in order for others to succeed. Or maybe you need to trust the ones you love. Or maybe Finding Nemo, a father's love can overcome anything. That's the big idea. That's what can be used throughout their lives. And so when we look at a project, when we look at an authentic learning experience, we're asking this question, what is the theme? What's the big idea that I want my students to take away? And I've always found it helpful when planning out authentic learning experiences, which I'm sure you've done before in your own classrooms, or at the very least have been, been engaged with as a kid when you were in school. Um, what I found with these projects is to have something called a driving question, something that's kind of driving the whole learning experience along. It's an open-ended, relevant question posed to students for them to investigate and attempt to answer throughout a project. So it's really stating that big problem. And the driving question encompasses that big idea, that theme of the story we're planning here. And so then I'm asking, as I'm thinking of literacy, what text can I use to help answer that big idea, help answer that driving question? So for instance, one time I told my students all about this woman named Deet Eman who lives in our community. And I told about how she survived the Holocaust and she was part of the Dutch resistance. And, and I used some different materials and I told them all about Diet Eman and this unbelievable Dutch girl who survived the Holocaust and the Nazis. So I told them about her and then I said to them, guys, did you know that Diet Eman is still alive today? She's 93 years old. And they're like, oh no, I didn't know that. It's like, yeah, I believe them. Like they didn't necessarily have grandparents like I did who fought in that war and lived through that conflict. So I said, okay, so she's still alive. What if I told you that she lives in our community right now? And many other veterans live in our community and they have not shared their story with anybody and all of them are going to be gone within the next 10 years and their stories are gonna go with them. So 
which is a reality, right? That's what happened with my grandfather. He fought in the war. Nobody took the time to write his stories down. And when he left this earth, his stories went with them. And it was a tragedy, a sadness in our lives. And so I presented this problem to my students. Their known world was, there's no problem with veterans and sharing their stories. But then after this learning experience, they're like, oh, we can do something about this. And so we did some brainstorming together and we went and talked to Deet Eamon herself and we brought our smartphones and remember we called them smartphones back in the day? We brought our smartphones and we filmed the veterans and we recorded our conversations with them. And we didn't have all the best technology in the world, but we did have phones and we did have boxes and duct tape that we could use as tripods or maybe they're called unipods. And we went and filmed these veterans with the goal of like, all right, we're gonna preserve their stories forever. Right, we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that when they're gone, their stories are still with us and we can continue to learn from their lessons for a long time. That was the problem, the authentic purpose of this learning experience. And so the students were given this authentic task. And for the next month, our goal was to capture these stories and use our Chromebooks to try to edit them into little documentaries and create some other stuff that's gonna preserve these veteran stories. So that is our authentic task. That's what's driving the students along in this project. That was the problem that was introduced at the beginning that made this learning experience main course rather than a dessert. It was there the whole time it was present and it's part of what's engaging students. They're now a part of a story. So our theme, our driving lesson for this, and this was kind of composed as I was brainstorming in community with other teachers as I was planning this project, is this question. How can we learn lessons from heroes in our community? If you ask that to my students at the beginning of this unit, they most likely would not be able to tell you the answer to that. The goal would be for them to be able to answer it by the end of it. And so that's, our, that's, that's the big driving question. So now I'm asking, all right, we're in English class, and, or you could say this for any class, I've got need, I need to make sure my students are being versed in literacy. They're getting opportunities to read, write, listen, speak. Uh, what was the, they're getting literacy opportunities. How can we use different texts? How can we give different literacy opportunities for them to be able to answer this driving question that I have for them, to be able to uncover what the theme of this project is? And so for this project specifically, I knew that I had this big question. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna go find texts that are gonna help me answer this driving question. And for, for my students, based on their different reading skills, I know some of them read the book Night by Elie Wiesel, which is his autobiography and telling about his experience and in, 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 uh, in concentration camps, which is what Deet Eamon went through. And so this is a text that I know is going to help those students be able to answer that big driving question, which is going to help them answer, you know, solve that problem that I introduced to them to capture these stories. Other students maybe show that like, okay, this is more an appropriate text for you. And we had them read the book Mouse, which is a graphic novel all about surviving the Holocaust. Some other students read the book Soldier Boys based on their reading level. Um, and, and that was the text that they had. And so now I'm having them read books that they were going to read anyway. If they weren't in my class, they still would have been exposed to texts that are similar to this, except now the motivation for reading these texts isn't solely because I told you to, or because it's in the common core, or because this was in the curriculum I was given, or because there's a grade at the end, or because there's going to be a quiz at the end of the unit, which all of those things are true. This isn't my curriculum. There is gonna be a grade, there is a quiz. Yeah, they have to learn to read this. Okay, so those are all true, but that's not the primary motivator anymore. The primary motivator is to gain context and knowledge so that we can capture the stories and experiences of people in our own community. That's why we did it, right? It's about solving that big problem that matters to students. And I know from over and over an experience, but also lots of research that shows that when students are given a, conf a conflict, a problem that matters to them, they're going to engage with materials like this at a deeper level. And so that's what we did with the project. You know, another example, and this is one I was just down in Indiana working with a school and we had this big uh, showcase. So I, we did a bunch of work in project-based learning last summer and then the teachers did all this work with their students. And then we had a big showcase where the community was invited to come and see all the work. And so I drove down there and gave a little talk and then we were doing the showcase. And uh, one of the groups, a group of fourth grade students had this driving question, how do we help people recover after a, na after a natural disaster? And uh, these students here, who had got permission to share their picture, um, they wanted to fundraise for a bunch of people affected 
uh, by um, the hurricanes down in Florida last fall. And so they did this huge fundraiser where students painted pumpkins and created children's books and sold them and did all this different work in order to raise money. And this group actually raised like $3,800 that they sent down to this school, this elementary school down in Florida. So they just did some unbelievable work and they asked their teacher there, what type of text, what kind of reading did your students engage in while they did this project? And again, here is the theme. How can we help people recover after a natural disaster? Natural disaster. There's our big driving question. And so, you know, she said, all right, well, th these are some of the tasks. I, she said, I wanted them to see how did other people uh, uh, adjust and, and adapt to natural disaster. Because the, the people down in Florida are not the first ones to undergo this. And my students are not the first ones to tackle some of these questions. And so let's see if there's some text that can shed light onto it. And so she shared some of the different texts that they explored. They looked at Grapes of Wrath. They didn't obviously read it in uh, fourth or fifth grade, whatever it was, but she talked about the story and showed them some clips of it. But they did engage with some of these other books, A Long Walk to Water and Zetuine. And so they looked at these, these texts in order to gain insight and context so that they could go and do this authentic task that I can tell you really mattered to these students because that is what service work does. And so, and then another thing is giving students empowerment. And, and that can happen when you give different options like this for them to choose from, or like we did in the World War II project, giving students opportunities to have voice and choice. That is at the key of doing this type of main course project work is I'm gonna curate different titles that have similar themes. And so not everybody has to read the same book as long as the theme helps apply to the problem we're trying to solve here. And so, you know, using different books and having different sections, reading different things, but they all might have the same common assessment, you know, um, and, but they all share the similar theme here. That's why with the World War II book, you can read Knight, you can read uh, Mouse, you can read Soldier Boys. I don't really care because they all have the same theme and they all go applied to the same problem of how do we preserve the stories from heroes in our community. And so giving voice and choice goes a long, long way, engaging, struggling readers, advanced readers. We all want to have opportunities to choose how we're learning and what we're learning. And so giving voice and choice also goes a long way. But then also providing purposeful literacy assignments, giving assignments where they're engaging in reading or writing, except now there's actual purpose behind it, following that theme of what we've been talking about for the World War II project. I knew my students at some point in my scope and sequence that year were going to have to write poetry anyway. I've got to do a poetry unit. So I remember when I, one of the years we did this project, I was like, you know what? Wouldn't it be neat if my students listened to the, the veteran stories and still made you know, the, the documentary, but what if also we had another component to it? What if we tied in our poetry unit to it? And so I said, all right, everybody, at the end of this project, you're gonna have to have your documentary, but also, you're gonna to have to turn in a poem for it. And it's gotta be based on the veteran's life and it's gotta be in certain formats. And I taught poetry how I usually teach poetry, which has a lot of different best practices applied to it, except now you're not writing this poetry for the hypothetical audience. You're not just writing it for the grade book. I'm gonna keep beating that dead horse. You're writing this poetry to serve veterans. You're writing this poetry to answer the driving question, how do we preserve the stories from heroes in our community, right? So now this literacy assignment that they were going to do anyway has this extra motivation pushing it along. Are you with me? There's something driving it. It makes it main course. It makes it more authentic for them. And, and there was other ways we did it. I also, one year I was like, you know what? All this podcasting is coming out all the time. And my students mostly have these technologies where they can record audio. And so what if we did long form telling of the veteran stories? And so, you know, some groups were creating documentaries, some were doing creative writing, some groups were writing out the transcript of the veteran speech, and then they were cu cutting it up and they were writing narratives and stories along it. We, we were storytelling. They were doing short story unit, except now we were using this technology. This is a way to engage students who might not engage otherwise. That's the key point here, is that students who may not be engaged and wanting to write poetry or create podcasts or make films for no reason, now do want to do that because there's something driving it along. And then at the end of this project, 
uh, we had a big event and I invited all of these veterans to come out and be our guests of honor. And we invited the whole community come to come and over 400 people packed into this auditorium. And my students showcased their work. They showcased their films, their writing. They had podcasts burned to these old ancient things called DVDs. Have you heard of them? And so we had all of this work, the product of their efforts, their elixir, what they gained from this experience was put on display and my students were able to showcase their work to the whole community. And you better believe they were excited about it. And I remember every year we did this project until we could no longer do it because we no longer had World War II veterans to interview, which was the point of this project. Um, but every year we'd select several students to be our MCs for the night. And they would have to write their welcoming speech and go up there and kind of perform it and communicate it, engage in literacy tasks. And I'll never forget the one year I had this student named Ravel, who just, man, he was just a, a, a complacent learner, you know, very, very apathetic to what we were doing and just kind of goofed off all the time. And I remember as we were doing this project, something about it caught his eye. He loved the veteran who we got to talk to and he just engaged with it all. And then when I asked him, hey, Ravel, what do you think about being one of the MCs for the night? and going up on stage in front of 400 people and uh, engaging the crowd and introducing it and explaining the project. And Ravel was nervous as can be about it. Who would it be? I'm nervous when I get in front of people. I'm nervous right now, it's, it's life. But man, there was something about this project that made him say yes. He was a little reluctant at first, but finally he did it. And I'll never forget watching this kid up there who's, who's you know, maybe his loud exterior in the classroom was a lot owed to his lack of self-esteem and lack of confidence. But all of a sudden this kid was just kind of standing tall and his posture was strong and he was engaging in ways I hadn't seen him engage before. And I like, you know, as I share the story with you now, it's just another reminder of the power that purpose has to engage students and engage all of us. Right, we want to learn more when we know that it matters. And so what if we found opportunities to tie literacy in to purposeful problem solving students are engaged in, that while we create and craft stories with students, finding ways to teach them what they need to learn in the midst of it all. You know, one more quick example, and then we will open it up uh, to some uh, Q and A. These were some content standards of a teacher I was working with um, in Kansas City. And uh, she had these standards that had to do with a few different standards. Maybe you've seen them before, like invasive species and the impact that humans can have on society. This was like a third grade classroom, I believe. So she had these standards and she's asking the question, all right, what's a big problem my students can solve while learning these standards in the science class? And so what she ended up doing was taking her students to a park across from the school that they play in a lot. And she had them observe all of the invasive species growing there. And she pointed out this one called garlic mustard, which is highly destructive to parks. It strangles out the native plant life, it doesn't smell very good, it's not beautiful. And she told them it's basically ruining their playground, it's ruining their park. So all of a sudden these third graders were like, this is bad. We need to do something about this garlic mustard, right? So they've been introduced to a problem. That's the beginning of the story. That's their inciting incident. And so they had the problem and then she laid it out for them. She said, this is what we're going to do we are going to coordinate a garlic mustard pull. So we're gonna to try to get people to come out and pick some weeds with us. And so to do that, we're gonna to have to organize an event. We're gonna to have to create materials to get people to come to the event. So we're gonna to have to market the event. But if we're gonna get people to show up and pick weeds, we gotta educate them about why this is actually a problem. And so we're gonna to have to do all this work. And so for the next month or three weeks, whatever they did while they planned this event, the students had to engage in research. Right? Because like, if you're going to be able to teach somebody about why invasive species are a problem, you're going to have to learn about it yourself. You're going to have to become well-versed in it. So those students had to learn about invasive species. So they had to learn to research it. Researching is key literacy, right? And so now we're not researching because the teacher said so. We're researching so we can learn about invasive species so that we can move on to the next step, which is write a persuasive speech to get people to come to the event or to get other students in the school to come to the event. And so they had to learn how to write persuasive speeches, something that happens in third grade classrooms across the world. And so now though, we're writing persuasively. And I know, I, I know I'm kind of just, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm saying the same thing over and over and I'm doing that on purpose because I want to drive the point in. They're not writing persuasively because that's something that's in the common core or it's in the state standards. 
because the teacher said so. We're writing persuasive speeches because we want to get rid of this garlic mustard that's ruining our park to solve this problem. So now we're writing persuasive speeches. She had her students present those speeches to other classrooms. Literacy is about communication as well and speaking. And so we're gonna have to learn to go and speak. And we're not just speaking because uh, it's speech class, it's an elective. No, we're speaking because we want people to come pull garlic mustard. And then in math, they were creating graphs to show the impact invasive species had. In art class, they were creating posters and using the vernacular and the words and verbs and everything they were learning in the other parts of class and they were applying them to the posters. And then at the end of this project, after doing all of this learning and literacy activities that was directly applicable to the problem they were solving in science class, so lots of literacy happening in a different alternative subject area, at the end of it all, bunch of third graders showed up at the park and picked weeds and that's the good stuff right that's the climax of the story that's that's where the problem that was introduced was finally solved and when that happens now those students can look back at that unit and it wasn't just a combination of different events and and standards and activities and homework yeah it was still all of those things but now there's a shape to all of that there's a shape to the learning experience and that shape is called the hero's journey that shape is something that's been in the human consciousness for thousands and thousands of years. That's a shape that our brains respond to at a deep level. It makes us engage. It makes us learn more. It makes us engage socially, emotionally, behaviorally, and cognitively. It's a story. And stories make us engage. And stories will help a reluctant leaders, readers and leaders uh, engage more in those tasks. Um, and it'll engage you too. So I'll wrap it up with this. If you are an educator of any kind, know that the power of purpose will get students to engage at a deeper level, but it'll also help you engage at a deeper level. So I'd encourage you to spend some time trying to figure out what is the purpose that drives me in all of the work I do? What is it that gets me up in the morning and uh, excited to go to school? Hold on to that. That's what drives us more than anything else. And the more you can articulate that to yourself and articulate it with others and articulate it with your students, the more it will do that good work on you and help you engage in the same way your students will when you do it with them. So. That is the first portion. I think, Jean, are you still there? Is anybody still there? It's hard to say. We're all still here. Yes, Yay. this is great. This has been right. wonderful. Thank you. And we do have some questions from the audience. Um, there are two that kind of overlap. Um, one person told a story of how she used to teach special ed and was, and she used this, your um, strategies, but she says, now what about teachers who are not given much latitude to teach this way? What is your experience with that? And how can teachers integrate this? Or do you find that to be true when you travel to different schools? Yeah, does that teacher share their name? Um, she does, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say. On no, I just, I just wanna say like, I hear Virginia. you. <laughs> I'll give you her first name, Virginia. Virginia, oh, meet Virginia. Je Virginia, I feel ya. Like there, there's just a truth to it. Like everything I shared here, was well let me just let me say two things first off the examples i gave are like year three of those projects right like it, they took some work in figuring out and how am i going to tie my curriculum into this and how am i going to do this in a way that's going to work in the school building i'm in and so when i give those examples and like oh everybody showed up and pulled weeds or all those veterans showed up those were the my, those were my best examples after a few years of learning those projects and how to integrate illiteracy and all that stuff. And so I just want to say, first off, if anybody has an impression like, oh, I love all that, but I could never nail it that hard. But yeah, you know what? That takes time. And so I don't, that wasn't even your question, but I do want to throw that in there. Secondly, though, the, the first school I worked at was made for this type of learning right? We had a, an administration that was all on board. We had other teachers on board. Students uh, knew when they started our school as a public school, but um, there was this choice element to it. When students came to our school, they knew what they were getting into. And so man, it just was easy at times to make this type of work happen. But then I would start giving talks and workshops on this stuff. And I'd hear feedback like, hey, I love what you're talking about, but uh, I work in a school where our desks were made in the 1940s, right? Like my, my, my grandparents' names are written underneath it. There's gum that's older than like America stuck under our desks. Like I don't have great furniture, or I don't have technology, or I don't have a principal that's supportive, or I got scripted curriculum, I gotta stay in this box. Now what? And it's like, ooh, I don't really know how to answer that. 
because I work where it's kind of easy. Does that make sense? And yet I, I kind of took that. I was like, all right, well, let's let's test this out. And so I went to a much more traditional school after my fifth year of teaching. Um, and uh, and and the, the principal was definitely forward thinking. So I don't know if we can relate on that one, Virginia, but the rest of the school, it looked like the same exact high school I grew up in. It was just, everybody sits in rows, you got 50 minute class periods, you've got students who got all of that. And I gotta tell you, purpose still works in those spaces. There was definitely constraints to what we could do. It, it wasn't as easy, sometimes I had to pair projects down a bit and really kind of focus on the meat. Like when we did the World War II project at the more traditional school, you know what, we, we didn't have as many things that my students created and so we had to pare it down. Um, and so it's really about fitting it within your own environment. But it's also just remembering the, the, the key component of what I've been talking about for the past hour is the power of articulating purpose. And so maybe you can't do a project as big as the World War II one or even the invasive species one. Maybe you can't go that big. That's okay, because none of what I'm talking about, I don't want to say that, oh, projects have to be big. They have to blow the walls off our classroom in order to be real stories. No, instead, what if, even within the framework you are in, you can articulate the purpose of what students are learning, right? Like, hey, we're reading this book because here's why we're doing that. That can go a long way in our brains and helping us uh, digest and metabolize why we're doing what we're doing and so just articulating purpose but then also being okay with like you know what? i'm gonna give you a hypothetical problem to solve or hey we're gonna do a court case after we read to kill a mockingbird and so while we're reading this text together uh we're gonna a, a, in groups write down how we're gonna apply this to the court case that we're gonna act out together maybe that's not as big and bombastic as the world war ii project but it's still a story that's happening there's still a main course component to it students know hey we're not just reading this book because the to kill a mockingbird's in the curriculum we're reading it so we can do this court case. So with that being awesome. said, I feel you, but also I think it's it's like, all right, how do I work with what I have? Mm -hmm. So this next question sort of, it goes back a little bit. You know, some of your projects are big and exciting and wonderful, but like you said, you can't always blow the walls off the place. So good, yeah. what are a couple of simple suggestions you can give to teachers on just getting started, just getting their foot in the door, just just getting going on projects like this that that yeah. help kids who are struggling or um, you know are not engaged to yeah. get them more engaged. Yeah, you know what I would suggest is just try it once and and not feel like oh I've got to go and convert everything I do if I'm an engaged students. Instead, like what if I take one existing unit that I have and I add a purposeful component to it. So for instance, when I was at this new school, um, I was like, oh, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. And, and this feels a little daunting, but I knew I had a, a Shakespeare unit. So I was gonna teach Shakespeare. And, and I know some of the best practices for teaching Shakespeare. I've learned that from other educators. And so I'm like, all right, this is how I'm gonna teach it. What's a problem they can solve while we're learning Shakespeare? And what we ended up doing is I told my students at the beginning that, uh, have you ever seen a 90 second video? like a 90 second video, a 90 second movie where, where somebody acts out an entire movie in 90 seconds or less. Google it, it's really, really funny. I said, we are gonna create 90 second films of Romeo and Juliet. And so every time we read, we're gonna read it and talk about it and do all the things we would do anyway. But while we're doing it, you and a group are going to create a script for your 90 second film. And at the end of the reading, you're gonna put it together in a short little video that you film and then we're gonna watch it together as a class and pop some popcorn and we're gonna watch our funny 90 second videos of Romeo and Juliet. Not a whole lot of extra work for me, right? Like I did, I had to cut out one day for filming and one day for editing, but otherwise I taught Romeo and Juliet as usual. They were summarizing the acts they were reading, they were engaging with it, but now there was this fun, purposeful component to it. Cause I don't know about you, but my students have always wanted to go viral in some way. There's something about putting it on the internet that motivated them. And so I was able to say, we're gonna, we're gonna put our films on YouTube and we're gonna watch them together and it's gonna be great. And so students engage deeper. I remember I had students in that class who just would not engage otherwise, but because they were making a 90 second film of Romeo and Juliet in the genre of zombies, they engaged at a deeper level. Right? Are you with me? That that that's that's the key component to it. And I don't think that takes a lot of extra work. And so kind of going back to Virginia's question, but kind of melting it in here is, you know, 
maybe it's just starting with a unit that you already have and just adding this component to it, adding some type of problem or purpose at the beginning and finding ways to reference back to it as we're doing all this learning and figuring out how do I tie in literacy activities to it. That's awesome. Awesome. Okay, we just have time for one more, um, yeah. Trevor. Um, someone asked, do you have any recommendations for free resources on classroom engagement? Can you recommend um, where they might find things or your site or whatever? Yeah, I think those are really great questions. Um, you know, I've got lots and I'll, I'm gonna give two, two of them. Uh, one is you can go to my website uh, and I'll show, I'll put the URL up for that in a minute. And I just, I put a lot of content on the internet about classroom engagement and literacy and different things. So you can go watch my videos uh, or read my two books, The Epic Classroom and The Collaborative Classroom where you can dive deeper into that. But there's also just a whole wealth of information with Voyager Sopris. And that's why it's been so fun to get to connect with them and uh, put this webinar together because uh, they provide a lot of different resources to help educators like all of us find ways to engage students on this. So that those are my two recommendations. And I, I think it's natural that uh, we I share those here. So Gene, if you wanna share a little Great. bit as well. Yes, okay, so um, here's, I wanted to let everybody know um, a little bit more about Voyager Sopris Learning. Um, Voyager Sopris offers reading, writing, math intervention programs. Um, anything you might need to help your students read better, those who struggle. We have Voyager Passport, which is research-based reading intervention for grades K through five. Um, rewards by the renowned Dr. Anita Archer. And we have Step Up to Writing for grades K through 12 to help um, help students cultivate that those writing skills. So go to voyagersopris.com and you'll find uh, more information on all of these products that we offer. Um, okay, next slide, Trevor. Um, speaking of webinars and things that are helpful, we want to share our next webinar with you, which is with Dr. Mary Dahlgren. Um, Sound Walls in Your Classroom, The Pathway to Reading Fluency. Um, Mary Dahlgren is sort of the gold standard when it comes to sound walls. She knows it all, and this will be a very useful um, presentation on using those sound walls in the early learner classroom, so like K through three. So um, make sure you go to voyagersopers.com forward slash webinars. That's part of our EdV360 webinar series, and you can register there. Um, and with that, let's go to the last slide. And um, oh, here's a little bit of information we wanted to tell you on how to connect with Trevor. TrevorMirror.com, which he mentioned earlier, his book is The Epic Classroom, and he also has The Collaborative Classroom. You can follow him here on all these um, social media channels, but that's a good way to get more information. And now we'll go to the last slide where we want to thank everyone for attending. Um, and mostly we wanna thank Trevor for sharing his experiences and his expertise with us today. We hope you learned something about uh, literacy and classroom engagement. Um, thank you and join us again next month for another great webinar with Voyager Sopers Learning. Take care. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks,